Chapter Nine of the Mayor of Casterbridge by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Nine. When Elizabeth Jane opened the hinged casement next morning, the mellow air brought in the feel of imminent autumn almost as distinctly as if she had been in the remotest hamlet. Casterbridge was the complement of the rural life around, not its urban opposite bees and butterflies in the cornfields at the top of the town who desired to get to the meads at the bottom took no circuitous course but flew straight down high street without any apparent consciousness that they were traversing strange latitudes and in autumn airy spheres of thistledown floated into the same street lodged upon the shop fronts blew into drains and innumerable tawny and yellow leaves skimmed along the pavement and stole through people's doorways into their passages with a hesitating scratch on the floor like the skirts of timid visitors hearing voices one of which was close at hand she withdrew her head and glanced from behind the window curtains mr henchard now habited no longer as a great personage but as a thriving man of business was pausing on his way up the middle of the street and the scotchman was looking from the window adjoining her own henchard it appeared had gone a little way past the inn before he had noticed his acquaintance of the previous evening he came back a few steps donald farfrae opening the window further and you are off soon i suppose said henchard upwards yes almost this moment sir said the other maybe i'll walk on till the coach makes up on me which way the way ye are going then shall we walk together to the top of town if you'll wait a minute said the scotchman in a few minutes the latter emerged bag in hand henchard looked at the bag as at an enemy it showed there was no mistake about the young man's departure ah my lad he said you should have been a wise man and have stayed with me yes yes it might have been wiser said donald looking microscopically at the houses that were furthest off it is only telling ye the truth when i say my plans are vague they had by this time passed on from the precincts of the inn and elizabeth jane heard no more she saw that they continued in conversation henchard turning to the other occasionally and emphasizing some remark with a gesture thus they passed the king's arms hotel the market-house st peter's churchyard wall ascending to the upper end of the long street till they were small as two grains of corn when they bent suddenly to the right into the bristol road and were out of view he was a good man and he's gone she said to herself i was nothing to him and there was no reason why he should have wished me good-bye the simple thought with its latent sense of slight had moulded itself out of the following little fact when the scotchman came out at the door he had by accident glanced up at her and then he had looked away again without nodding or smiling or saying a word you are still thinking mother she said when she turned inwards yes i am thinking of mr henchard's sudden liking for that young man he was always so now surely if he takes so warmly to people who are not related to him at all may he not take as warmly to his own kin while they debated this question a procession of five large wagons went past laden with hay up to the bedroom windows they came in from the country and the steaming horses had probably been travelling a great part of the night to the shaft of each hung a little board on which was painted in white letters henchard corn factor and hay merchant the spectacle renewed his wife's conviction that for her daughter's sake she should strain a point to rejoin him the discussion was continued during breakfast and the end of it was that mrs henchard decided for good or for ill to send elizabeth jane with a message to henchard to the effect that his relative susan a sailor's widow was in the town leaving it to him to say whether or not he would recognize her what had brought her to this determination were chiefly two things he had been described as a lonely widower and he had expressed shame for a past transaction of his life there was promise in both if he says no she enjoined as elizabeth jane stood bonnet on ready to depart if he thinks it does not become the good position he has reached to in the town to own 
to let us call on him as his distant kinfolk say then sir we would rather not intrude we will leave casterbridge as quietly as we have come and go back to our own country i almost feel that i would rather he did say so as i have not seen him for so many years and we are so little allied to him and if he say yes inquired the more sanguine one in that case answered mrs henchard cautiously ask him to write me a note saying when and how he will see us or me elizabeth jane went a few steps towards the landing and tell him continued her mother that i fully know i have no claim upon him that i am glad to find he is thriving that i hope his life may be long and happy there go thus with a half-hearted willingness a smothered reluctance did the poor forgiving woman start her unconscious daughter on this errand it was about ten o'clock and market-day when elizabeth paced up the high street in no great hurry for to herself her position was only that of a poor relation deputed to hunt up a rich one the front doors of the private houses were mostly left open at this warm autumn time no thought of umbrella stealers disturbing the minds of the placid burgesses hence through the long straight entrance passages thus unclosed could be seen as through tunnels the mossy gardens at the back glowing with nasturtiums fuchsias scarlet geraniums bloody warriors snapdragons and dahlias this floral blaze being backed by crusted grey stonework remaining from a yet remoter casterbridge than the venerable one visible in the street the old-fashioned fronts of these houses which had older than old-fashioned backs rose sheer from the pavement into which the bow windows protruded like bastions necessitating a pleasing chasse de chasse movement to the time-breast pedestrian at every few yards he was bound also to evolve other terpsichorean figures in respect of doorsteps scrapers cellar hatches church buttresses and the overhanging angles of walls which originally unobtrusive had become bow-legged and knock-kneed in addition to these fixed obstacles which spoke so cheerfully of individual unrestraint as to boundaries movables occupied the path and roadway to a perplexing extent first the vans of the carriers in and out of casterbridge who hailed from mellstock weatherbury the hintocks shirton abbas kingsbeer overcombe and many other towns and villages round their owners were numerous enough to be regarded as a tribe and had almost distinctiveness enough to be regarded as a race their vans had just arrived and were drawn up on each side of the street in close file so as to form at places a wall between the pavement and the roadway moreover every shop pitched out half its contents upon trestles and boxes on the curb extending the display each week a little further and further into the roadway despite the expostulations of the two feeble old constables until there remained but a tortuous defile for carriages down the centre of the street which afforded fine opportunities for skill with the reins over the pavement on the sunny side of the way hung shop blinds so constructed as to give the passenger's hat a smart buffet off his head as from the unseen hands of cranstown's goblin page celebrated in romantic lore horses for sale were tied in rows their forelegs on the pavement their hind legs in the street in which position they occasionally nipped little boys by the shoulder who were passing to school and any inviting recess in front of a house that had been modestly kept back from the general line was utilized by pig-dealers as a pen for their stock the yeomen farmers dairymen and townsfolk who came to transact business in these ancient streets spoke in other ways than by articulation not to hear the words of your interlocutor in metropolitan centres is to know nothing of his meaning here the face the arms the hat the stick the body throughout spoke equally with the tongue to express satisfaction the casterbridge market-man added to his utterance a broadening of the cheeks a crevicing of the eyes a throwing back of the shoulders which was intelligible from the other end of the street if he wondered though all henchard's carts and wagons were rattling past him you knew it from perceiving the inside of his crimson mouth and a target-like circling of his eyes 
deliberation caused sundry attacks on the moss of adjoining walls with the end of his stick a change of his hat from the horizontal to the less so a sense of tediousness announced itself in a lowering of the person by spreading the knees to a lozenge-shaped aperture and contorting the arms chicanery subterfuge had hardly a place in the streets of this honest borough to all appearance and it was said that the lawyers in the courthouse hard by occasionally threw in strong arguments for the other side out of pure generosity though apparently by mischance when advancing their own thus casterbridge was in most respects but the pole focus or nerve knot of the surrounding country life differing from the many manufacturing towns which are as foreign bodies set down like boulders on a plain in a green world with which they have nothing in common casterbridge lived by agriculture at one remove further from the fountain-head than the adjoining villages no more the townsfolk understood every fluctuation in the rustic's condition for it affected their receipts as much as the laborers they entered into the troubles and joys which moved the aristocratic families ten miles around for the same reason and even at the dinner parties of the professional families the subjects of discussion were corn cattle disease sowing and reaping fencing and planting while politics were viewed by them less from their own standpoint of burgesses with rights and privileges than from the standpoint of their country neighbors all the venerable contrivances and confusions which delighted the eye by their quaintness and in a measure reasonableness in this rare old market town were metropolitan novelties to the unpractised eyes of elizabeth jane fresh from netting fish seines in a seaside cottage very little inquiry was necessary to guide her footsteps henchard's house was one of the best faced with dull red and gray old brick the front door was open and as in other houses she could see through the passage to the end of the garden nearly a quarter of a mile off mr henchard was not in the house but in the store-yard she was conducted into the mossy garden and through a door in the wall which was studded with rusty nails speaking of generations of fruit trees that had been trained there the door opened upon the yard and here she was left to find him as she could it was a place flanked by hay barns into which tons of fodder all in trusses were being packed from the wagons she had seen pass the inn that morning on other sides of the yard were wooden granaries on stone staddles to which access was given by flemish ladders and a storehouse several floors high wherever the doors of these places were open a closely packed throng of bursting wheat sacks could be seen standing inside with the air of awaiting a famine that would not come she wandered about this place uncomfortably conscious of the impending interview till she was quite weary of searching she ventured to inquire of a boy in what quarter mr henchard could be found he directed her to an office which she had not seen before and knocking at the door she was answered by a cry of come in elizabeth turned the handle and there stood before her bending over some sample bags on a table not the corn merchant but the young scotchman mr farfrae in the act of pouring some grains of wheat from one hand to the other his hat hung on a peg behind him, and the roses of his carpet-bag glowed from the corner of the room. Having toned her feelings and arranged words on her lips for Mr. Henchard, and for him alone, she was for the moment confounded. "'Yes, what is it?' said the Scotchman, like a man who permanently ruled there. She said she wanted to see Mr. Henchard. "'Ah, yes, will you wait a minute? He is engaged just now.' said the young man apparently not recognizing her as the girl at the inn he handed her a chair bade her sit down and turn to his sample bags again while elizabeth jane sits waiting in great amaze at the young man's presence we may briefly explain how he came there when the two new acquaintances had passed out of sight that morning towards the bath and bristol road they went on silently except for a few commonplaces till they had gone down an avenue on the town walls called the chalk walk leading to an angle where the north and west escarpments met from this high corner of the square earthworks a vast extent of country could be seen 
a footpath ran steeply down the green slope conducting from the shady promenade on the walls to a road at the bottom of the scarp it was by this path the scotchman had to descend well here's success to ye said henchard holding out his right hand and leaning with his left upon the wicket which protected the descent in the act there was the inelegance of one whose feelings are nipped and wishes defeated i shall often think of this time and of how you came at the very moment to throw a light upon my difficulty still holding the young man's hand he paused and then added deliberately now i am not the man to let a cause be lost for want of a word and before ye are gone for ever i'll speak once more will ye stay there it is flat and plain you can see that it isn't all selfishness that makes me pressy for my business is not quite so scientific as to require an intellect entirely out of the common others would do for the place without doubt some selfishness perhaps there is but there is more it isn't for me to repeat what come bide with me and name your own terms i'll agree to him willingly and without a word of gainsaying for hang it farfrae i like thee well the young man's hand remained steady in henchard's for a moment or two he looked over the fertile country that stretched beneath them then backward along the shaded walk reaching to the top of the town his face flushed i never expected this i did not he said it's providence should any one go against it no i'll not go to america i'll stay and be your man his hand which had lain lifeless in henchard's returned the latter's grasp done said henchard done said donald farfrae the face of mr henchard beamed forth a satisfaction that was almost fierce in its strength now you are my friend he exclaimed come back to my house let's clinch it at once by clear terms so as to be comfortable in our minds farfrae caught up his bag and retraced the northwest avenue in henchard's company as he had come henchard was all confidence now i am the most distant fellow in the world when i don't care for a man he said but when a man takes my fancy he takes it strong now i am sure you can eat another breakfast you couldn't have eaten much so early even if they had anything at that place to give thee which they hadn't so come to my house and we will have a solid staunch tuck-in and settle terms in black and white if you like though my words my bond i can always make a good meal in the morning i've got a splendid cold pigeon pie going just now you can have some home brewed if you want to you know it is too early in the morning for that said farfrae with a smile well of course i didn't know i don't drink it because of my oath but i am obliged to brew it for my workpeople thus talking they returned and entered henchard's premises by the back way or traffic entrance here the matter was settled over the breakfast at which henchard heaped the young scotchman's plate to a prodigal fullness he would not rest satisfied till farfrae had written for his luggage from bristol and dispatched the letter to the post office when it was done this man of strong impulses declared that his new friend should take up his abode in his house at least till some suitable lodgings could be found he then took farfrae around and showed him the place and the stores of grain and other stock and finally entered the offices where the younger of them has already been discovered by elizabeth End of chapter nine